Hey, welcome to a new video. And today we're doing some copper chemistry in the form of copper acetate. Now, in terms of making chemicals at home, copper acetate's pretty approachable. All the stuff you need is pretty widely available and it's not gonna kill you unless you drink it like a dumbass. So that's cool. So as you can see, starting out, you need vinegar, of course, your acetic acid for your acetate, along with hydrogen peroxide to dissolve the copper and a hot plate or something like that to heat it up. I'm not bothering with the stoichiometry for this, so just mix together approximately equal amounts of the vinegar and the peroxide. Then you can set it on a hot plate and set it to a little under 100 degrees Celsius. But now you're probably wondering, where are you getting all the copper from? But you know what? I'm glad you asked. Pennies, obviously. In the US at least, older pennies were made with about 95% pure copper, which is good for our purposes. So check for any dates prior to 1982 and you got yourself a copper penny. And technically anything before 1962 is bronze, but the composition of copper is just about the same, so it doesn't really matter. And up in Canada, they were made with mostly copper all the way through 1996. But of course around here, the US copper pennies are easier to come by, so that's what I'm using. Now, once the solution is close to boiling temperature, you can just drop the pennies in like this. And upon dropping them in the peroxide acetate solution, you'll notice that pretty much immediately there's some bubbling and the liquid turns a pale greenish color. This is the copper dissolving off the surfaces of all the pennies, which of course starts the second the pennies hit the solution. And you can see already it's got a pretty strong effect. And in less than a minute, the solution's already pretty opaque. And while watching this bubble away a bit, I'll take a bit of time to say what's actually happening in this reaction that you're seeing. So as the reaction goes, you start out with just two atoms of copper, which react with four molecules of acetic acid and four molecules of hydrogen peroxide. And that then produces two molecules of copper two acetate, six molecules of water, and an O2 molecule. And this reaction, of course, I'll put right up on screen. So of course, when this reaction occurs, the oxygen gas escapes as the bubbles that you can see here, and the water can simply be evaporated off. And there may be other things, for example, small amounts of impurities of stuff that's just on the pennies, but I'll get to that in just a second. And you may have noted that I said that this produces oxygen gas, which it does. And of course, oxygen gas is flammable, so that is definitely something that you're gonna need to watch out for. And obviously apply all the common safety precautions when you're dealing with something flammable. Now here's a bit later towards the end of the reaction. Here I turned up the heat just a little bit above boiling by accident, but you can see as it cools down, it gets a lot more transparent, and in my opinion, a lot more of a beautiful shade of blue-green. And really, I didn't realize this at first, but the solution is just absolutely gorgeous. You can see here all the bubbles and stuff rising through it. I just think it's, it's super pretty. It's really cool. And I think it almost looks like stars in a galaxy or something like that, but of course, all in that signature copper bluish sort of color which again, I think is just a beautiful color. And as you can see, there's a lot of floating greenish stuff that's built up in the bottom area of the beaker, along with, of course, the pennies that are left over from the reaction, which I chose to remove just by using a little spoon and a napkin to put them in. Please don't criticize me for this. I do know that it's dumb and I probably lost a little bit of the yield from that, but there are other dumber things I did further down the line, which you'll see. One thing I noticed pretty quickly was, when I set down the first couple of pennies, they sort of got a little bit darker and changed a little bit as they dried out, so I set up the camera when I set down the other ones, and this is kind of what that looked like, which I think is kind of interesting. I don't exactly know what it is, but it's interesting, I think, anyway. And here's how the liquid has cleared up and gotten a little bit lighter blue after a minute or so, and how more of the greenish stuff has settled towards the bottom. Okay, so here's where I break off just from the pure reaction, just a little bit to kind of say what I did and how that was pretty bad and how I definitely should have done it better. And if you do this, what you should do, because it's really not that hard of a reaction, but I still managed to mess it up. So back before I made the YouTube channel, around March or April-ish of the year of our Lord 2020, back when people had some semblance of hope that their lives wouldn't be turned upside down for the next two years, I happened upon this random video on YouTube saying, Hey, here's this cool chemical. It's not all that useful, but you can make it at home, and it's a pretty blue color, so here you go. And I thought that was pretty cool, so I decided to make some and record it for some reason, which probably led to the channel. But anyway, here's that. 
So to begin with, I didn't know that simply heating the solution would speed up the reaction a ton, so I genuinely just left it overnight and waited, and obviously that took a while, and also thank you for noticing I did do it in the mason jar. But as you can see, the product I got was completely the same, so the reaction itself went completely fine. But once I had the solution, I was very impatient, and I really didn't want to just wait for it to evaporate, so I decided to just grab my little trusty camp stove and boil it off. And as you can see, here's the setup I had, just on a little stool in the garage. And for some reason, I didn't even bother to remove the pennies first, even though the copper acetate would precipitate out right onto the pennies, which was kind of dumb. So as you can see, I really didn't give much regard to the point at which glass would break, especially, you know, non-borosilicate glass like this is just normal glass. So of course, I just felt free to just turn the heat all the way up. And just as I thought it was coming to be completely dry as I turned the camera off, it broke, obviously. And so I realized that I had been pretty dumb doing that, but I managed to scrape the remaining copper acetate off the bigger shards of glass and put it into a little bottle here which I didn't accurately measure, but a rough estimation was about 30 mils. And why I haven't since accurately measured it was because I lost it. But anyway, I really didn't feel satisfied with that, so I decided to just try it again, but this time use a metal pot, logically, so it wouldn't break. And this is a different kind of me being a dumbass, not considering what kind of metal the pot was made of, though. Certain types of metal, like if it was made of steel, for example, would have been fine. But this pot that I used was an old pot from a camping mess kit, and therefore was made to be really light, and therefore was made of aluminum. Which, of course, reacted with the copper acetate, and produced aluminum acetate and copper metal. I was literally just precipitating out copper again, and had done this for literally nothing. And it's such a simple reaction, and that's just such a dumb mistake to make, so I still kind of kick myself for that. And so as you can see here, it looked like it was going fine for most of it, but towards the end of it here, you can see I slowed the time lapse down a little bit, and you just get copper out. And so the remaining copper acetate, I think, actually looked pretty interesting, but it had still kind of gone to waste. I scraped it out of the pot, but I was just left with this complete mess of copper acetate along with copper and aluminum acetate, and I didn't really think there was anything I could do to separate it apart because even though the copper isn't soluble in water, and the acetates are, so I could separate those pretty easily, I really don't think there's any way that I could have separated the acetates, at least nothing that I could do at home, because I really didn't have access to that much, and really don't much now either. But anyway, that was a complete failure. And you can see here the garbage that I was left with. You can see, again, the little bits of copper and copper acetate, and little whitish bits that are the aluminum acetate, but it was kind of just a complete mess. So yeah, don't make that mistake. Anyway, now let's jump back to the present day with another problem, yet again, stemming from my impatience and not wanting to just let it evaporate. Seriously, I could have literally just spread it on some tin foil or on a pan or whatever and just let it have a fan blow over it and leave it overnight. And that would have been a completely fine, legitimate way to do it. But I was just too impatient. And so I decided to, yet again, boil it off. Having gained a little bit more knowledge about chemistry, and a cool hot plate, I decided to try it again pretty recently. Because genuinely, it's a really simple thing to do, it's like a really basic elementary school student home reaction, but it annoyed me that I messed it up. So I put it in a borosilicate beaker that could handle higher temperatures, and on a hot plate, and set it to a temperature that was high enough to boil it fine, but low enough to not break the beaker of course. And a bit off topic, but there's something that I noticed here that I think is pretty cool, which is the bits of copper acetate that are in the solution floating up and then around over the top, forming almost ring-shaped sort of convection currents going up and down within the beaker, which I think is super cool. And a little bit similar to what goes on inside of the earth, which is a little interesting sort of science lesson thing. And as you can see, the sunset, and also the majority of the boiling of this solution went pretty well, and there wasn't really anything signifying that anything was going to go wrong. And as you can see by this point, there really wasn't that much liquid left. And again, unrelated, but I think it made a pretty cool sound when I switched it around. And you're starting to see the darker and more opaque crystals among the lighter, more transparent liquid. But I made a mistake. Again. I let it run too hot for too long, and even though it was on a hot plate, I still managed to burn the crystals. 
What I'm pretty sure happened here is that they just sort of decomposed and I'm left with some copper acetate, but also a bunch of just carbon. Which I think is a pretty reasonable assumption considering that the decomposition temperature of copper acetate is only 168 degrees Celsius. Still, I think it looks pretty cool though. And so here's the other copper acetate mess that I had after scraping it out of the beaker. And you can see, again, the mix of the colors. In this case, the bluish of the copper acetate and the darker clumps of the carbon. And in addition, what I had left in the other beaker had a lot of copper acetate around the rim, but just a ton of carbon residue on the bottom, which is of course where it was right up against the heat of the hot plate. But I wanted to see if I could somehow separate the carbon from the copper acetate. So I took a small amount and put it in a little beaker, and then added some water to the point where it was just able to dissolve all of it, which did seem to work, but now that it had the carbon in it, it seemed to form a super opaque solution, which was obviously really dark and really different from just the copper acetate solution that there was before. And interestingly enough, it seemed for some reason to form a little bit of a greenish hue or something to it. I really don't know why, but as you can tell, I got interested and put the camera up close to it. It just got a little greenish. And still, that is a complete mystery to me, so if you have some answer to that in the comments, or if it's just some random impurity, uh, feel free to tell me. Because, yeah, that's kind of weird. So I then let it out overnight to dry, and the results were the following. So yeah, it does look like there was some separation between the copper acetate and the carbon, but they're still in the same solution, which is of course what I was trying to avoid. And so I'd still have to resort to manually separating them. So for this bit at least, this is where I stopped. In the future, I'll probably separate them using alcohol or something like that, but now I'm just pretty tired. And due to my being pretty dumb and making mistakes, this video is quite a bit longer and a lot later than I thought it was going to be. Especially considering how simple the reaction itself is. So I'll probably make a much shorter part 2 to this at some point, which is where I just finished that up. But anyway, it's been a while, so uh, happy Halloween, and bye.